It's been a little while since I got to wave this sticker around in front of a camera. It's a great introductory card. It's a very, very good way to introduce myself without actually saying anything. I can simply wave this thing around softly out of focus, or maybe you could just view it as being a soft focus object. The sticker that says Malcolm Tent. Prettier than Jello Biafra, smarter than the Nuge. I like to tell things the way it is. And who indeed am I? And what indeed is happening? Well, if you're a regular here on social media, and you're the type of person who is on Facebook regularly, then you'll know what's going on. You'll know that what we're looking at right here is me, Malcolm Tent, live on Facebook, and that it is indeed a Wednesday. It is indeed 7 p.m., and this is indeed Tent Talks Tunes coming at you. You don't need 3D specs when you're watching Tent Talks Tunes because the action is so intense, the energy waves are so powerful that you can feel it and you can see it coming at you without any artificial enhancements. That is, of course, providing that the technology is working. So I'm going to grab the monitor here my portable monitor device, and we're going to check it out. We're going to look and see if you people are able to see me, hear me, feel me, touch me, watch me. Oh, apparently a few of you are watching. You are live, and I am here. All right. Yes. Stephen, Grant, Matt, some other names, ah, Andy, John, the Baptist, Pear from Sweden. Got a whole bunch of you folks watching, living, learning, listening, loving, right here on the Facebook. This is, of course, provided that you're not watching it at a later date, archived on my YouTube channel, the Malcolm Tent YouTube channel which if you have not subscribed to yet, you really need to. There's a lot of good stuff over there. Not just Tent Talks Tunes, but playlists of music. <coughs> Excuse me. Music playlists. I've got a playlist of some of my favorite vintage wrestling videos. I've got the Shoot Interview series where I talk to people about music and stuff. There is a lot going on there on the Malcolm Tent YouTube channel. I think there's a link on that channel to the Anti-Scene official YouTube channel, which is the other YouTube channel that I curate in order to use the modern parlance. I curate that mother. And that's got all the Anti-Scene stuff you could ever hope for on YouTube. So go to YouTube. Get lost in the rabbit hole. Stay there for a few weeks. I can pretty much guarantee satisfaction. Excuse me again. <clears throat> Little known fact, <clears throat> I picked up a, a bit of a bug a few weeks ago, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was in North Carolina, and it, it, it's cool, it's over, it's done, I feel great, but <clears throat> I project so heavily when I do Tent Talks tunes that I almost invariably throw out my voice, so there's always a little bit of extra coughing and hacking, so I hope you guys will bear with me. It's just one of the things I do to serve you better. <clears throat> All right, enough of the pain and the agony. Let's check what's going on here. Let's check the bulletin board, shall we? We can see already on the bulletin board your stern admonishment to go to the Malcolm Tent YouTube channel and subscribe. I will also invite you, since you're online, to go to my website, malcolmtent.net. If you can see the spelling there, M-A-L-C-O-L-M-T-E-N-T.net. I just updated this thing. One of the, the biggest parts of my website and the one that is 
always a work in progress is the performance log. I've been making an effort to document every single gig I've ever played from the very first time I ever set foot on stage, which was a high school talent show in the year 1980, maybe 81. See, it's a good thing I've got it on the website because I've already forgotten. From the very first time I ever set foot on stage at a high school talent show up until the very most recent concert I played with the almighty anti-scene just a few weeks ago in Charlotte, North Carolina. Every single gig is listed along with the bands who I played with at each individual show, a lot of brief anecdotes about each individual show, and wherever possible, links to audio and video for the shows. So if you're the type of dude or dudess who's like me, and you just love raw data and facts and figures and little thumbnail sketches of history, go to malcolmtent.net click on the performance log and just get ready to get lost because there's a lot of stuff there and I honestly think I've got I think now I've got every single gig I've ever played listed there I'm pretty sure they're all up I've been working on this thing now for about 12 years not like every single day but consistently Whenever I go through the archives and I find a show that I had forgotten about that I played, I post it on the website. As a matter of fact, there might be one. Check this out. <clears throat> I was digitizing some tapes over the holiday period and I came across this one. The original cassette head. Mayhap, mayhap the greatest band that ever set foot on a Danbury stage head they played a gig at a place called Debbie's in Danbury, Connecticut on July 19th, 1991. And I did a guest spot on one of the songs, which I'd completely forgotten about, completely forgotten about until I digitized the tape. So this one may or may not be on the website. I don't know. But if it's not, it will be soon because now I'm aware of it. And I'll also recommend if you, po if you folks out there like your 90s sludge rock, Check out Head, H-E-D, Head. They've got some astounding music posted on their Bandcamp page. I mean, stuff that still blows my mind 30 years later. They're the band who should have conquered the world, man. Head, ugh, another one of the joys of doing what I do. Let's see what else is on the bulletin board here. We got the your usual recommendations to go check out my Discogs and eBay stores because I got a lot of stuff for sale there. Label stuff, fine used product by other bands. And a little mention of one of my groups, They Hate Us. How do you like this poster by John Truby? John Truby drew this for us. Send me a, a line, and if you want one of these things, I'll fold it up in an envelope and send it to you. How's that for service? I'll do it. If you like this art, if you like my band, I'll send you a poster. All it costs me is a 58 cent stamp, and all it gains you is eternal satisfaction. Nice way to welcome in the new year, innit? Just write me, I'll do it for you. Speaking of mail, got a couple of interesting things as we check the mailbox. Danbury Tap every week. This is very exciting to me. I got an envelope. You can't really see. There's no postmark on it, but an envelope from Massachusetts which, which contains paperwork. Paperwork which grants me the right to release a long-lost Gigi Allen album. It is an official release. It is something that only came out once on cassette in the late 90s and then disappeared into obscurity after that. I got the paperwork, I got the signatures, I got everything I need to officially re-release this long lost Gigi Allen album. That's a teaser. You'll hear more about it as things progress. Coming up in 2022. Woo! 
On a related note, I was talking to everybody about the uh, Gigi Allen and the disappointments. I'm not drinking tonight. Limited edition cassette and CD of 100 copies each. I got the cassette labels that are going to go on the cassettes, which are hand signed, hand signed by two members of the disappointments. The two who will sign things, T. Ricky and Bob Pringle. So that's a pretty neat touch. That will be happening in a few weeks. Keep an eye on the Gigi Allen fan page on Facebook for more information on that. And um, that's about it. We've checked the bulletin board. We've checked the mailbox. Calendar's empty. Let's get down to the nitty tacks and let's talk tunes, shall we? <laughs> Let's check the monitor first, because I like to interact with all you folks, and the best and pretty much only way to do it is to uh, check this thing. James Pogo from the great band Armed Delight Rifles said it uh, most accurately. D stands for drink, fight, and fudge sickles. <laughs> Drinking, fighting, and fudging, baby. Yes, oh my gosh, look at all you people. Grant Den, the original guitar player for Broken Talent, says that he wants that art on a toddler snowsuit. I think it's a damn good idea, Grant. Darn good idea. Dang good idea. All right. We're talking about the letter D tonight. D. That's an approximation of a D. D stands for a lot of stuff. The reason I'm talking about D is because last week I talked about D-O as in Ronnie James Dio. And someone pointed out that even though I spent an hour talking about Ronnie James Dio, it was maybe the least metal talk on Dio ever given. Because I'm not really a big fan of Dio's later metal stuff. I am a big fan of his earlier pre-Black Sabbath, pre-Rainbow rock and roll material that he cut when he was still living in Cortland, New York, out there by Syracuse fascinating body of work the guy created. So while I was pulling the Dio records to talk about, I had one of these many, maybe not many, but several boxes of seven inch singles in my personal collection, whoo, which I'm not going to drop, I promise. And then of course went into the D section. And I was leafing through all those D records arranged by artiste, and I thought, man, there's some pretty cool stuff in here. I think I want to talk about them. Now, anybody out there who's got one cloth ear and has known me for more than eight minutes is well aware well aware of my deep-seated fascination, worship, and love for a certain band whose name begins with D. And maybe some of you out there were maybe a little bit nonplussed when I said that I'd be talking about the letter D today because D could really only stand for one band. Let's see if anybody's guessing what that band is. How well do you people know me? If I'm going to talk about D, what band could that possibly have been? Let's see. Uh, no Decimator. No. Dio we talked about last week. No. Maybe the guesses are coming through, but we all know there's a big lag between what I'm saying now and what you're typing and what's going to show up. So I'll just... I'll end the game right now, as Flipper would say. D, of course, stands for Devo. Guess what? I'm not talking about Devo today. Not talking about Devo. Only enough to say that if I talked about Devo, I'd have to dig deeply into this box of Devo 45s. And also... This box of Devo 45s, 
these two boxes do not even contain my friends a comprehensive devo forty five collection. you would need a lot more box power than this to get a truly comprehensive devo forty five collection i'm just a piker when it comes to devo records so i'm not going to talk about them i've already done that anyway you go to my youtube channel you'll see devo talks galore i'm going to talk about bands that begin with d that aren't devo today and it's still going to be fun i promise it's still going to be fun now looking at the box if any of you out there were particularly eagle-eyed you'd notice that i have these handmade dividers separating the letters of the alphabet there's a c and there's a d and you can see those those dividers are pretty old and shop-worn and dog-eared. And this is going to be a mutual voyage of discovery for me and you. I made these dividers sometime in the mid-80s using whatever flyers I had just laying around. I would fold them up into fours and write the letter on the divider. And you can see they've, they've had a lot of use. So just out of idle bone curiosity, let's see what flyers I folded up to use for dividers. Okay, here's D. Right, look how, look how yellowed that is on the top and worn out it is. What I had to make a D divider was, ah, uh, okay. An old piece of graph paper. I'm sure you children of the previous millennium will recognize graph paper if you tried to do any kind of uh, geometry problem solving or maybe any kind of uh, graphic art paste up work. You used a piece of graph paper. I used a piece of graph paper to make a D divider. And even though we're not talking about C, let's see what the C divider is made out of. Mm, that's weird, empty sleeve. C divider on a piece of paper, oh, which used to be an M divider. All right. Oh, this is a flyer. Oh, this is a good one. Look at this. I know some people out there who will appreciate this. I made my D divider back in 1984, I guess, from a spare flyer that was just laying around from South Florida, the cell. I guess formerly the cell, Perones All Ages Club Grand Reopening, Friday, October 4th, 1984, Disorderly Conduct, F, and Nobody's Heroes. Me, oh my. Oh my, oh me. This should probably be in the Smithsonian Institute, or at the very least, a South Florida museum of some sort. Maybe the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but it's not. It's folded up into four pieces and it's marking where my D, or I say where my C records end and my D records begin. That's what we call utilitarian historical artifacts. I'll drink to that. All right, let's leaf through these D records and see which catch my eye, catch my fancy, and we want to talk about. And I'll just kind of do a really quick flip and show here. Here's a record by the Dadistics. Don't remember anything about them. Dag Vag, or is that Dog Vog? It's got one good track on it. This is one that I've always been very fond of. The Damned. Prokofiev, tour only 7-inch from, I believe, the first reunion tour that they played with uh, the original lineup from 1991. In my opinion, not a great record, but I'm just an absolute sucker for these kind of tour only releases. And this one was very low key. There was a, I, this was like very hard to find even at the time. I think you really, really had to buy this at the show or pretty much nowhere else. And it's weird because if I recall correctly, it's the original lineup of The Damned, but playing more of the goth 
style stuff that they, that they did in the late 80s with the Roman Jug Bryn Merrick era. And yeah, it just kind of doesn't really go anywhere. I, I like The Damned an awful lot, but this is not the best damned record in the world, no pun intended. But since it does fit in with my collector's aesthetic, I'm keeping it. Now, if you want my opinion, this is probably the single best damned single ever. The love song, Noise, 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 Suicide, UK three song EP. Black vinyl pressing on Chiswick. Is this one autographed? It's autographed. Yes, it's got tiny little autographs on the label. You can see that. It is a, uh, a period correct set of autographs, too. Can we get better focus on that? We can try. Whatever. It's 21st cable, 21st century cable TV. What do you want? This is the new improved camera, by the way. Imagine what it would look, what it would have looked like with the old and lousy camera. You know, I got some more autographed damned records here. Who's this? Fred Darian. Oh, this is a cool one. Fred Darian. I originally picked this one up, and I I buy, trade or find most of my records or at least an awful lot of my records, just if they look interesting. I mean, to me, that was great label artwork. Awesome typeface, and it's a, it's a song called Strong Man on a label I've never heard of before. All those factors just really piqued my interest, and it's pretty cool. It's a song by Fred Darien about the strong man who's trying to steal his girl. The punchline being that the strong man ain't such a strong man. I would bet that you can find this posted on YouTube somewhere. Pretty good tune. A permanent part of the MT personal collection. This is one that you might not have, might not expect in the MT collection. I wouldn't have expected it either. But a really, really interesting story behind this guy right here. Bobby Darren. Bobby Darren went through a number of metamorphoses during his life and during his career, from suave, tuxedoed crooner to sort of hippie protest singer. And this is one of his later ones called Long Line Rider. It's really neat. I wouldn't even know how to describe this one, but it's not, it's not Mac the Knife by any stretch of the imagination. Um, 1970-ish. I believe he died in 1972, so it's kind of toward the end. Very interesting, like, post-hippie tune by Bobby Darren, but very sincere. You know, it seems to me that all, like all of Bobby Darren's artistic, artistic changes were sincere, and he was definitely driven by a desire to expand his horizons artistically, culturally, however you will. Quite often with mixed results, and I believe with comparatively little commercial success, but he never stopped. And for that alone, I respect the man immensely. So here's a drink of good Danbury tap to Bobby Darren for sticking with it. Let's see if anybody else here has something to say about Bobby Darren or any other uh, hot topics. On the monitor, live, who's got to say what about what? Let's see, yeah, this is very, uh, very behind. I'll have, to check, I'll have to check this out later. Just knowing that you guys are there is good enough for me. Spencer Davis, why do I have a Spencer Davis? collection must be a good b-side i can't get enough of it oh okay that's what it is everybody in the universe knows the spencer davis song i'm a man it's been done to death you can hear it in any supermarket right now if you walk in and they're playing it over the muzak system but the b-side i can't get enough of it good track in my opinion far better than i'm a man certainly a lot less played out than i'm a man B-sides are so much fun, man. In the golden era of the 45, 
at least half the fun was checking out the non-album B-side to the record. Quite often the B-side would not ever get put on an album, at least not until many, many years later. So you had to buy the single in order to hear the B-side. Pretty good example of that. Let's see here. The DBs. You know, the DBs are a band who I've tried really hard to like. I don't really like them that much. This is a good one. Ups and Downs. Ask for Jill. Yeah. Not one of my favorite bands. Decent record. Here's an interesting one. Decrete. Why do I have a Decrete record? Who are they? I should listen to this. Ooh, here's a good one. Very fond of this one. I might have talked about this one before on Tent Talks Tunes, but this, my friends, is a bona fide stone cold original first pressing of the Dead Kennedys California Uber Alice. How do I know it's a first stone cold original pressing? Because it's on the original, original gray alternative tentacles label. That's the A side. That's the B-side. That's before Winston Smith designed the iconic Bat logo. And first Dead Kennedy single was pressed on Alternative Tentacles, and then they signed a deal with this other label called Optional Records. And most of the copies that you see of this are on the Optional label. And those are still kind of hard to find, but this is the hardest to find. And I'm just a gigantic mark for the dead Kennedys. So I love this kind of stuff. Stone Cold First Pressing Alternative Pentacles. Now the exact opposite story applies to this one right here, which is a first pressing of Holiday in Cambodia. Now the most common version of this is the Alternative Tentacles pressing, but this is the optional pressing which is only out for maybe a year, maybe a couple of years. It's got the same pole pot label, different color as the regular alternative tentacles pressing, but it's on optional. And you can spot these right off the bat because the original sleeve is printed on non-glossy paper and it's got the white border around the edges. That's the immediate tip off to the optional pressing. So if you're a total freaking geek like I am for these pressing variants, there's a couple for you to look at right there. Woo-wee! I've only seen a couple of these ever. I've only seen a couple of those alternative tentacles, California Uber Alice's as well, one of which a friend of me, a friend of mine mailed. I believe it was Todd Jenkins, aka Todd God, the man who discovered Churchill's hideaway in Florida. He mailed me a copy of the Dead Kennedys gray vinyl, I should say gray label California Uberalis. <clears throat> and by the time it got to me, a great big chunk snapped out of it. <sighs> Record collector's nightmare. <clears throat> but I made good use of it. If you ever shopped at Trash American Style, the store on Mill Plain Road, as you were walking out, if you looked up, <clears throat> and a bunch of you trashies will know that what I'm talking about, I had a big mosaic of extremely rare, desirable, collectible records that were either broken, warped, smashed, or so beat up you couldn't even play them. So I had that gray label Dead Kennedys record with a big chunk broken out of it hanging on the wall over the door as you walked out of Trash American Style. Just something to give you bad dreams at night, like they gave me every night of my life for 21 years. It was rough. Rough, rough, rough. Let's see here. Hmm. Here's a band, The Dead Trees. I must have played a show with them somewhere. And I liked the record enough to keep it. I have to play that one again. Jimmy Dean. Ah, this is a good one. 
Senator Roscoe Dean. This is a great political artifact from the elections of 1972. On the great world of sound label, Senator Roscoe Dean ballad to George Wallace. The thing is, I really don't, I don't do politics. I don't care about politics in the slightest bit. But I do love it when senators and mayors and other elected officials try to sing. I love that kind of stuff because it is 99.9% .9 guaranteed to be really, really bad. And old Senator Roscoe Dean, it is it's so a so-called ballad to George Wallace, but it ain't much of a ballad, baby. It ain't much of a ballad. It is absurd. So I salute all the politicians out there who think they're entertainers. And while they are entertainers, maybe just not the way they thought they were entertainers. I got lots of these political records. I love it when they try to sing. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. Also a great label, too. I mean, it's just another one of those examples of very bold, handset typefaces and fonts. Those are all those are all fonts that you're not going to find in your average TTFF file. Everything done by hand. I really like that. Very bold, very striking, and also very cheap. You can tell that's the uh, side of the record that was exposed to sunlight regularly for years and years and years because that red is gone, baby. Gone! Cheap ink. Priceless entertainment. What's next after Senator Roscoe Dean? Aha, <laughs> Death Penis. These guys are Danbury stalwarts. 90s alt rock. Any of you Danbarians out there remember these guys? They were fun. They, they didn't play out very much. Like so many bands from so many eras, they got it together just enough to press one record and then disappear. But this is stuff. This stuff is really catchy. It's hooky. It's well written, well recorded. Who was their leader? Big Ed, I think his name was. I don't remember. This is this is cool. Any of you Hat City relatives or Hat City natives out there, chime in if you remember Death Penis and have something to say about them. Ah, here's a good one. Everybody knows that the Sun label was the, you know, the home to Elvis and Jerry Lee and Carl Perkins and Johnny Cash and the early Charlie Rich stuff. But man, Sun put out a ton, maybe even five tons of hot, amazing, unhinged rock and roll and blues and R&B and straight ahead country music. This one here by a guy named Jimmy DeBerry. I know little or nothing about this guy, but it's a double A side. Uh, this this is a burner. This is so good. May even be his only record ever. Jimmy DeBerry on the original Sun label. And this one, I think, is a repro. Yes, yeah, this is a repro, probably made in the, in the uh, 80s. Original Sun records typically didn't have that much give to them. But somebody in the early 80s cranked out tons of reproductions of original Sun 45s, focusing only on the most obscure and in a lot of times wildest sides that were on the label. They're out there. If you, they're a lot easier to find than the originals, that's for sure. So they're out there. And a lot of them are really worth picking up because whoever did them knew their stuff and made sure to put out only the best. So Jimmy DeBerry, good example of that. Man, Sun Records. Oh, here's a good one. I like this one a lot. Pardon me while I hydrate a slight bit. Any of you folks out there know that I love cheesy, sleazy, exploitation cash-in records. I adore them. I collect them avidly. On my label, TPOS, 
I have released a number of compilations of sleazy, fly-by-night, cynically made, cheaply done exploitation records. I've got a, co a compilation of Beatles exploitation records, punk rock exploitation records. Um, I've got one that's, excuse me, loosely of psychedelic exploitation records. And this is one of the gems of them. The Deep Six. I really hope you guys can make out the title of this one. The Deep Six doing Come On Baby, Blow Your Mind. And you would certainly hope with a title like that, it would be just some kind of insane, wild, out-of-control fuzz rocker. Or maybe reverb-drenched garage side. No, no, no. The Deep Six is basically a watered-down version of the Fifth Dimension. It's a bunch of corny, Caucasian studio musicians doing a weak rendition of the sound of the Fifth Dimension with lyrics about, come on, baby, blow your mind. And the B-side's got another great title, Image of a Girl. But come on, baby, blow your mind. That's the hit. So cynical. Love it. Love it. Let's see. Deer Hunter. Oh, here we go. I've talked about this one a lot, so I'm not going to belabor this one too much. But just in case you've never seen the various posts before, and you don't know the history of Malcolm Tent, the very first record I ever bought with my own money. At the J.C. Penney department store record counter, I paid my 99 cents plus tax, which came out to a dollar four, of my own money for the first time ever, my own allowance money for the first time ever in the year 1975, I think it was. Come on, baby, blow my mind. Give me a copyright date. 76. 1976. <clears throat> and I have no regrets whatsoever. You'll notice the record is still in my personal collection with the RSO generic sleeve. First record I ever bought with my own money. And I can play it right now and get off on it. You ready? Can you read that? Can you read that? I will say no more. I love this record. Ah, let's see the Delphonics. Oh man, on the on the Philly Groove label, Delphonics. This is real good stuff. Delphonics, baby. Down is up, up is down. With Didn't I on the B-side. I love that Philly soul, man. Mm, a lot of it's a little too sweet for my taste. Lots and lots of strings. In fact, I was talking to the unimpeachable president for life, Jeff Clayton, from Anti-Scene, a little bit earlier today. And he said he loves... He loves the, the soft vocals and the sweet love songs. Me, not so much. I think he might like some of this. I'll have to put this one aside for future consideration. I'm not, I'm not going to go on and on and on about the Delta Five. I was going to say, if you don't know the Delta Five and you love your 80s post-punk, with female vocals, Delta Five. The B side to this one, you, my friends, it doesn't get much better than that. Look it up, make sure your dancing shoes are on. You, by the Delta Five. They're kind of like au pairs. A lot of their stuff is really dour, but when they get upbeat, which isn't very often, it really works. 
Ooh, here's a new, here's a slice of the new wave of British heavy metal for you. A picture disc. My demon. There it is. That is a demon right there. Check it out. One demon on a disc. Begins with the letter D. D, 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 D. Worth noting, it's on the, if you can see that, the Clay record label. Got the logo down there. Clay, the home of Discharge. Discharge and Demon on Clay. Mm, mm, mm. Now, this is a weird one. Oh, man. Yeah, this is one of these private pressing records. A guy, oh, man. A guy named. D, D, E, Denise. And this is one of those records that is just like so completely sincere and so guileless and so heartfelt, but at the same time just so bad that you gotta love it. The titles say everything. On the A side, my life has overflowed with sorrow. And on the B side, you hurt me the most. I don't know what this guy's problem was, but it was apparently pretty big. There's even a press kit talking about how miserable the dude was. Ah, same deal. Just look at this, man typewritten by hand using a piece of carbon paper with a photo stat of the guy's business card on top and he even signed it on the bottom in duplicate with a piece of carbon paper this is the kind of stuff you literally don't see anymore you'd be very hard pressed to find a carbon paper to make a letter in duplicate with or a typewriter for that matter but D. Denise whose life overflowed with sorrow did it. A salute to D. Denise, wherever you are. Wherever you are. I hope your cup no longer overfloweth with sorrow. Let's go through a few things here. Oh, here's a band, you know. You wouldn't think it, but there, there are certain bands who I don't really care for that much, but they're able to grab one song that I really, really like. There's a few bands like that. One of them has a song found on this very floppy, flimsy, flexi disc. And that band, I doubt you'd be able to see this at all, but this is Depeche Mode, baby. A Depeche Mode flexi disc featuring the original lineup with Vince Clark, which is pre Yazoo and Erasure and Assembly. Yazoo, I love. Erasure and Assembly, I don't like. And Depeche Mode, I don't like. But this one song on a Flexi that was given away with Flexi Pop Magazine out of England in the early 80s, a chirpy little song called Sometimes I Wish I Was Dead. I don't agree with the sentiment, but I love the song. It's a chirpy, happy purely synth driven pop song and it's great and it's also a different version from the one that was officially released on vinyl somewhere later great stuff and you could only get it by buying flexi pop magazine because it was a giveaway flexi how cool is that by the way if you go to my youtube channel i did an entire tent talks tunes on flexi discs and how damn cool they are Mm. Ah, here's some more good soul stuff for you. The Detroit Emeralds. The Detroit Emeralds. You want it, you got it. On the Westbound label, you might recognize the Westbound label, all you Funketeers, for releasing uh, the early Funkadelic stuff. Pretty sure the label, m label must have been from Detroit. Had to have been. A lot of good soul sides on that label. 
put that one aside for old JC later too. What else have we got? Oh my god, you know? I'm kind of running out of time here. Ah, here we go. You people haven't heard me go on a tirade in a while, have you? I think it's been a while since I've gone on a tirade. Well, I found this record in my collection, and it just triggered me. Who would have ever thought that I would have to post a trigger warning while looking through my own record collection? One's record collection is supposed to be a safe space. But I, in my perverse fashion, have curated a record collection that has at least one trigger in it, and I just found it. I found the trigger. It's triggered me. I'm going to go on a tirade. So put on your safety helmet. Fasten your seat belts, take a deep breath, and get ready for the tirade. But before I tirade, using that word as a verb, pretty cool, huh? Let's check the monitor. Who's got to say what about what? And let's see, it's way behind. But oh, right, yeah, yeah, we got a lively discourse going on here, and that's very cool. Andy Miller says, D for Dead Moon. I, I only have one Dead Moon record at all in my collection, and it's an LP. D for Dave Brocky. Love that guar. Love that white flag. Don't have any. Dream Syndicate, Days of Wine and Roses. Excellent, excellent album. Yes, Dead Kennedys. Yes, we did talk about Dead Kennedys. DBs. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good stuff, good stuff. B-Sides. Glad to see you guys are paying attention. Love it. All right, enough of the good mood, feel good shite. Let's go on a tirade, shall we? We shall. I like this record a lot. I really like this record. But it didn't occur to me until fairly recently that the story behind this record is probably the same story as that behind Soundgarden. And if any of you folks out there on the internet research team want to look this up, I'll bet it can be found out there somewhere. My story, my tirade, makes a lot more sense if you can find an artifact called the Soundgarden Ultra Mega OK Press Sheet. It also might be under the Soundgarden Ultra Mega OK Promo Kit, Soundgarden SST Press Release. Hey, Harry. Harry just jumped in the window and he's yelping. Oh, and here he comes. He might even get on camera here. He might defuse me a little bit, but I'm still going to tirade. Keywords would be Soundgarden, SST, press release, promo kit. It was a very big deal if you were back there in the early or early 90s, late 80s, the ascent, the ascension of Soundgarden. Everybody was happy for Soundgarden because they were they were making it big. They started out as a little band from Seattle with a couple of independent 45s that they released. And then they got a couple of records on Sub Pop, and then they got their record out on SST, and then they got signed to A&M, and the rest is hysteria. Good for them. Bravo, bravo. They scaled the ladder. They pulled themselves up by the bootstraps and made themselves famous. Guess what? Not the case. Not the case. Now this press kit I was just yelping about a second ago, the SST, press kit, Soundgarden, promo sheet, whatever you want to call it. 
I've got it somewhere in the archive. Somewhere there's a whole box of these things, and I've got this. This from the desk of SST on an SST letterhead is going through the usual spiel about promoting their new album by Soundgarden. There's a very interesting paragraph on this press release. It says, why would SST go through all the trouble to release and promote a record by a band that just jumped from S that just jumped from sub pop and is about to be signed by A and M. Well, because we like the record, was their reply. But they just laid out the entire marketing strategy for Soundgarden. The whole thing was a complete and utter premeditated shill. The band jumped from Sub Pop to get signed to A&M, but the band had to have one more, or you know, as part of the grand strategy for marketing these guys, one more album on a, a label with indie cred, and that of course was SST. Remember, this is SST, the same label that put out the Corporate Rock Sucks stickers and t-shirts and Don't Suck Corporate Rock Cock or whatever it was. And Corporate Rock Still Sucks. Maybe all the money that A&M gave them paid for those stickers. I don't know. But the fact that Soundgarden was, was marketed in the exact same way that the Blair Witch movie was marketed. Fake indie, baby fake indie. And as I think about it, the Smashing Pumpkins career arc and release schedule followed the exact same route. 145 on a completely unknown independent label, and then Sub Pop, and then Caroline, and then they went to the mother label of Caroline, which was Virgin. Little too neat and clean, if you ask me. Maybe the internet research team can find out the story behind that. I'm willing to bet that that's exactly what it was, a cynical marketing ploy. So I started thinking about this record as I was mentally going through the D box. You know, at the time it was really exciting and I'm gonna I'm going to reiterate that I really like this record. I love this record. It was really exciting when Dinosaur Jr. had a record come out on Sub Pop. It didn't make a whole lot of sense, you know, because they had already had some, you know, classic stuff on SST and on Homestead before that. And then all of a sudden they've got a record on Sub Pop. And wouldn't you know it, their next release was a major label release, the Green Mind album seems to follow a certain trajectory of two other bands I just talked about with their cynical marketing ploys. Because you gotta remember, SST, I mean, uh, well, SST was super cool, even at that late stage of the game, and Sub Pop was red hot at that stage of the game in the early 90s, late 80s. To have a record on Sub Pop gave you instant, crest, instant cred, instant prestige. So, okay, Dinosaur Jr. goes from Homestead to SST, to Sub Pop, to a major label. Only in their case it didn't really work that well because they didn't sell that many records and they got dropped after a while. But The Wagon, the original version of The Wagon on Sub Pop. Pink Vinyl. This is the first record they did after uh, Lou Barlow was tossed out. This boded so well for the future. This song, this version of this song kicks so much ass, you won't be able to sit down for a week after playing it. It's so good. I love this. This is my favorite dinosaur record of all, period. And I like the SST albums. I like You're Living All Over Me, and I love Bug. No pun intended there either. Bug's a great album. This, I think, is the pinnacle of their achievement. And Green Mind ain't too bad either. But, you know, now that I think about it in terms of it being just another completely skeptical, cynical cash grab, 
it does tarnish it a slight bit. But there's no denying how good the song is and how cool it was when this record came out. If their purpose was to generate buzz, they succeeded admirably because I had to buy these by the box load when this record came out. I don't know how many of these things I sold, but this was a genuinely hot single. And it still is. Love this record. Look it up. Don't know if this particular version's been reissued. I think it's just an alternate mix of the album track. Not sure. But, I, but the album track doesn't have quite the punch that the original single version does. And it's really good. Really good. Cynical marketing ploy or not, it's still really ding dong, dang damn good. Which is why it's in my personal collection. And I think that I'm going to wrap it up with a tirade. Oh, look at that. We come right back. And I'm going to wrap it up there because the next record in the box was the Dio record I talked about last week. So I got more D's to talk about, but I ain't gonna. I think you all get the basic idea. D is a very fruitful alphabet when it comes to great records by cool bands on the 45 RPM format. So I'll just reiterate. I'm going to wrap up. If you guys like the They Hate Us 11 by 17 poster, drop me a line. I'll mail you one. I'll fold one up, put it in an envelope, and I'll send it to you. Because I love the art of John Truby, and I'm, of course, a big fan of the group I'm in. They hate us. Free poster for you. All it's going to cost me is a 58-cent stamp. Or a combination of vintage stamps that I have from a giant old stamp collection I bought years ago, which I will stick on an envelope until they add up to 58 cents. It actually, when you think about it, doesn't really cost me anything. It's already there. So yeah, They Hate Us poster for you if you want it. My website, malcolmtent.net, freshly updated with past gig archive information. Of course, my YouTube channel. Please subscribe, give it a like. And of course, my Discogs and eBay store. I'm a frugal dude. I live simply. I'm able to do what I do because I sell records. So if you guys want to go onto the Discog store especially and check it out, maybe there's something there you want to purchase. If not, hit me up with a want list. I got lots of records. As I was saying earlier to Jeff Clayton, I am rich with records. The bank account could use some expansion, but the vinyl collection, I got thousands of them. And in this new normal, I don't have too, too many outlets for selling them. Record shows are few and far between. So if you've got a want list, hit me up. I'll be happy to try to fill it for you as I shuffle around the house in my jammies because I can. Just because I can. So as always, guys, thanks for tuning in. Love getting to talk tunes with you. And... Not sure I'll be back next week. I might have some band business to take care of next week. Excuse me, but I'll let you know. And if not then, then the week after. Because I love doing Tent Talks tunes. Don't plan to stop anytime soon. So until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State. <laughs>